Hello everyone and welcome to the One Stop Co-op Shop. This is Colin and today we're going to do a top 10 list. We're going to do our top 10 solo adventure games. Now we just did a top 10 solo dungeon crawlers and how I see these as being a little bit different is the dungeon crawler is more focused on the combat and an adventure game has combat and actually my number one has a lot of combat but there's a lot of other things you can do as well and you'll focus on and one of the main ways that you can win usually is not just by combat. Now, there will be some exceptions, but in general, that's what I would say for an adventure board game. Now, there's a couple that I haven't played that I really think would be on this list, but I just haven't gotten them to the table, so I wanted to give them a couple nods. So the first one is Shadows of Malice. That one looks amazing. I just haven't gotten it to the table. Another one is Fortune and Glory, which I think looks like so much fun from, from um, Flying Frog Productions. Yeah, looks awesome. And then the final one, and this one just came out, and Rolling Solo has an uh, unboxing video of it, and I'm hoping to do a playthrough of it soon. I'm just going to get my copy today, and that's City of Kings. I think that looks like a great adventure game. It's probably going to hit somewhere in this top 10. But they won't be in there because I haven't played them, so let's get going. Let's look at our top 10. Elbion's Legacy, designed by Thomas Gofton, Aaron Murch, and Cameron Parkinson, published by Lavender Productions, is a 1-6 player adventure game set in the world of King Arthur. In a solo game, you can choose between two and four Arthurian characters to explore the realm of Elbion. You'll be completing quests, defeating enemies, and obtaining a special artifacts and loot along the way. The basic game comes with about four different scenarios in the box, but the deluxe version has almost twice that many. You'll need to utilize careful planning and a fair bit of luck to win this game. The reason I really enjoy this game, first of all, is the theme. All the cards in the game just drip with theme. Whenever you draw an event card or you draw an enemy card, it totally makes sense in the world that you're playing in. The tiles that you explore provide you with locations that you'll know from the story of King Arthur. And I have to say, they did a great job of implementing the theme into the mechanics so you remember things very easily as you're playing the game. The mechanics aren't difficult because they follow the theme itself. I have to say, I also really enjoyed the dice in the game. On the dice, you'll have one of each stat, but you also have a mana side. And when you roll that mana side, it can count as two of any of the stats. So that allows you to be a little bit more risky so that you can decide, you know what, I'm only rolling three dice, but I have a good chance of at least getting three successes because of that mana. <laughs> and I love that. I love that. Oh man, I'm going to do it. I'm going to roll it and see if I succeed. It's, it's really fun and it works well in this game. I also really appreciate that they use these destiny tokens in the game, and you can use these tokens to re-roll your dice. So if you fail, you can re-roll them. But here's the thing. It's not only that, you also get to add a, another symbol for success. So let's say I'm doing a movement test and I fail at it. I can use a destiny token to re-roll, but now I can also say altruism is another success. And so when I roll dice, I have, a more, I have more chances of succeeding. And I really like that. It really helps mitigate all of the luck in the game. I absolutely love the exploration. This is my favorite part, exploring the realm and creating a, a unique story when those tiles come up. There are three different exits for Camelot itself, and so you can go and explore in three different ways, have your heroes meet up in different areas. Oh, it's just so incredibly cool. The game comes with tons of different characters, and that is a lot of fun. And you know what? If your character dies, you just grab another one and you keep going. And I, I really like that. I don't have to feel like when I'm playing my one character, once he gets wounded, I'm useless. No, if I'm wounded, I'll just get myself killed, and then I can start with another one. I really like that. Now, I will say this game is not for you if you're looking for high-quality components. It was self-published, and you can tell that. And that's fine for me. I still enjoy the game, but if you're looking for a high-produced game, yeah, this might not be for you. I also don't like how when you get into a fight, you fight to the death. There isn't a way for you to escape a fight. You have to keep rolling, you keep taking damage, and you're done. I wish there was a way where I could maybe just take a simple wound and then run away, but no. It's once you're in the same area as an enemy, you fight them to the death. Seventh Continent, designed by Ludwig Raudi and Bruno Soder, published by Series Pulp, is a 1-4 player cooperative adventure game where players act as explorers from the early 20th century, exploring the seventh continent of the world. You'll begin the game stranded on a remote island where all you know is that you've been cursed. You must explore the world around you using an action deck that also constitutes your life's. 
If ever that deck runs out, you must randomly draw from your discard pile, and if a curse card comes up, you've lost the game. Conversely, if you find out how to stop the curse before your action deck runs out, you win the game. Now, I need to make a caveat here and say that I have never won a game yet, <laughs> but I have enjoyed this game. It is said that in order for you to build the entire seventh continent, pulling out all the necessary cards, no single table would hold all of that. That means that, you know, they've created such an expanse. It's so awesome. As a solo explorer, this just gets me excited. There's so much to discover and explore and new challenges to meet. I also really like the challenges in the game because not all of them are about combat. Actually, a lot of them aren't. And this is because you can tell the focus of the game is the exploration and discovery, not the combat itself. The look of this game is simply just gorgeous. There really isn't much else you can say about it. <laughs> the map consists of cards that perfectly fit together, and when you put them together on the board or on the table, it just looks wonderful, and you feel like you are there on that actual continent. And let's be honest, who as a board gamer doesn't like maps, right? <laughs> and you're going to be exploring and creating a map as you go. The game utilizes this really cool unique skill check system where you're going to be drawing cards from your action deck trying to get a certain amount of stars to succeed. And you can always draw more cards than you are required to to try and get those successes. But the more that you draw from those cards, the faster you're going through your, your life. And so the more likely you are to lose. So you have to balance this and I really like that mechanic. Now I will say there's a lot of things about this game that don't work for me and so this may not work for you if... You want a game where you have a certain direction. I feel like when I'm playing this game, I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm just simply exploring. That works well, but if you want to have a direction, yeah, that's uh, you're not going to get that in this game. I also have to say for me, I don't really like wild goose chases. In this game, you have tons of those, and they can last you hours upon hours. Now, a lot of people, that's perfect, but for me, it just doesn't work as well. And finally, it is a very repetitious game. You're going to be doing the same actions over and over again. There aren't a ton of things that you can do other than explore and move, and so you'll be doing that over and over again, drawing from your action deck. And since the game can be so long, you might get a little bit tired of it. Lord of the Rings The Adventure Card Game, designed by Nate French and published by Fantasy Flight Games, is a cooperative adventure game in which one to about four players, if you have two copies of the base game, can attempt to complete a scenario by adventuring through all the specific locations of the quest. As a solo gamer, you can play one or two-handed, but in general, if you want to have a good chance of succeeding, you'll probably need to run two decks. You'll pick your three heroes and construct a deck of cards that hopefully synergizes well as you will take on different scenarios. You'll be exploring through a location deck, but there will also be enemies to fight, side quests to complete, locations to explore, and treacheries you must overcome. Do you have what it takes to save Middle-earth from Sauron? The first and foremost thing that I like about this game is the theme. As someone who's read all the books multiple times, have watched all the movies at least a dozen times, <laughs> I am totally into the theme. And so the game brings you into that and I appreciate that. Although the game is a lot about combat, really the game is about the adventure and exploring through that location deck. And I feel like they did a great job doing that with just a simple deck of cards. You feel the challenges that your heroes have to overcome as each round more and more location and enemy cards show up and all of this is going to increase your threat level and yet you're also trying to complete these quests so you're trying to get above their threat level so you can complete quests. Yeah, it, it's really great. I also have to say I really enjoy the deck construction considering that I was a Yu-Gi-Oh player back in the day. I loved building my own deck of 40 cards to play for Yu-Gi-Oh and it's the same thing here for Lord of the Rings. You may spend more time building than actually playing, but for me that's okay because it's an integral part of the game. I really appreciate that this game is deterministic, meaning that there are no dice rolls. The only randomness is you don't know what cards are going to flip and that uh, potentially when you draw shadows, certain things can happen. But overall, things are deterministic, so you can be m more strategic. I will say this game is not for you if you don't want to get into a living card game. That means there's tons of expansions. Things are coming out all the time, although I will say they're not coming out as much, <laughs> but they are coming out a lot. With There's a lot of content out there, and it's also harder to find the older packs, and you might have to spend a pretty penny to get them. Also, if deck construction is not your thing, this may not be your game. 
but there are some pre-constructed decks out there that you can play. You can find them online and try them and use them out. That's actually how I started and I would highly recommend that. Robinson Crusoe Adventures on the Cursed Island is a cooperative worker placement adventure slash survival game where players work together to try and survive on an island. In a solo game, you can choose any amount of characters that you want to be, but if you choose less than three, Friday and a dog could potentially be your companions. Each turn, you'll be trying to determine which actions are most important for you to take in order to survive. Also, there are different scenarios which provide you with additional win or loss requirements. One of my favorite ways to play the game solo is with the campaign, which pits you on a five game campaign where you assist Darwin on his adventures. Why I like this game is first of all, the adventure itself. I love how you are adventuring on the island, trying to find different areas of land so that you can build certain tools so you can survive. First thing you do, you gotta find a place so that you can build a camp. So that means you've gotta go and find either a cave or explore so you can build your camp. And I just, you know, all these simple things that you're building and putting together, it's wonderful for an adventure. I absolutely love the dice mechanic in this game. You wanna succeed at something? Use two, two of your workers, because you only have two workers. So use both of your workers and succeed. Don't have to roll dice. But if you are trying to get everything that you need to get done, you have to split your workers. And that means you have to roll dice that have different probabilities of, of success and if you'll have adventures or wounds. I love how this works. Each round, you have to make this determination of which way do I want to go? Do I want to guarantee this or do I need to do more things at one time? I love it. I will say I also enjoy the fact that I'm building in this game. So I'm building up from nothing. I start with absolutely nothing except for an idea for a shovel. <laughs> and then by the end, I might have a snare to catch additional food. I'm, I've built a shelter with a roof. I have a palisade. Yeah, you just, you kind of build everything up and that is so much fun in a game. I love going from nothing and then building up from there. Now I will say this game is not for you if you're looking to win all the time. The event deck can be very brutal and it can make it where it's almost impossible for you to win. And you know, that's okay to me because it makes sense from a theme perspective, but for some people that might be a turnoff. Also, if you're looking for a shorter solo game, this wouldn't be it. The game is gonna be long. A lot of times it's seven to 12 rounds. One of my favorite ones, the family, uh, Robinson family, is 12 rounds long. So it can get really long. So don't look for this for a short game. And finally, if you're just not interested in the theme or you don't enjoy worker placement, yeah, this isn't gonna be for you. Zaya, Legends of a Drift System with Embers of a Forsaken Star expansion is a one to five player competitive game where players race to be the first player to receive 20 fame by completing missions, finding exploration tokens, and upgrading their ship. In the solo game, you're gonna be pitted against three NPCs who race you to the 20 fame points by using a variable AI system. Depending on how the NPC's behaviors are set, you'll have to find your own way of scoring fame before they do. Why this game is so good solo is first of all, you'll play as one ship. You don't have to run anything but that single ship. It's you and the ship taking on those NPCs. I find that the AI in this game is a huge plus because there's four behavior cards. Each one has two different sides on it and you're gonna roll to determine which enemies or which NPC is gonna use which behavior. It's really cool, it's simple, but it also provides a unique experience each time you play. This game focuses a ton on the adventure and exploration and not as much about combat. So you certainly can go and try and take out some of those NPCs, but you may find the best thing for you to do is avoid the NPCs and get your fame points by exploring, completing missions. I really like that. The solo game with the expansion comes with a campaign and the campaign gives you different objectives each time you play. I think that's so cool and it provides you even more replayability as a solo player. I also just love how it looks on the table. There are so many tiles, it creates a unique universe each time you play, and the miniatures are painted. Oh, it looks so cool, I love it. I will say this game's not for you if you're not into dice rolling. Everything is determined by dice rolling, your actions, your movement, but I will say that with the expansion, they provide you with ways to mitigate that. So that's why I would highly recommend getting the expansion if you can. This is also not a short game. So once again, a lot of people look for solo games that are short and quick, this one is not. This one you'll need to set up and keep up at least a couple nights probably before you can finish it. Finally, if you're just not into the space theme, 
it's heavy into space. So if you're not into that, you're probably not going to enjoy this one. Assault on Doomrock, designed by Tom Stasiak and published by Beautiful Disasters Games, is a 1-4 to four player cooperative adventure game set in a humorous fantasy world. In a solo game, you'll control at least two characters who begin the game with some random characteristics such as being sadistic, stinky, frustrated, <laughs> and all of those give you different benefits and uh, a, side, uh, a setback as well. The game is broken up into two distinct parts. The first part is all about preparing for the combat ahead, and you'll be adventuring together through certain locations, trying to find loot, upgrading your skills, and who knows what else. You'll also need to ensure that at the end of the third round, you arrive at the final location from the location deck, otherwise you'll lose. After the adventure phase comes the combat phase, where you're very likely going to die a horrible death. <laughs> the game utilizes this abstract combat system where health tokens denote your opponent's health and you're going to be using dice to activate your powers. These fights can be quite challenging and can cause you to have to think a little bit outside of the box in order to win. If you can defeat all three levels of increasingly difficult enemies and get to the final location card, you win the game. But don't expect that to happen too often. So what I really like about this game is the unique feel. I just like how the game feels different than most that I've played. With the two different phases and how you activate your heroes in combat and how the enemy's AI works, it just gives you a different feel when you're playing it because you've got these totally different phases. First, you're going to be adventuring, then you're going to be doing combat, then you're going to go back to adventuring, and it just it works really well. I also really like how you level up as a player. So as you gain experience, you can use that and everybody can level up getting new skills, getting new loot, getting, uh, uh, I think it's like called luck. You can get additional luck so that you can reroll dice. Yeah, it's, it's great. I also like how all the heroes feel so different. And when you add in those characteristic cards, it even, it's even more different. So I can play the same hero and still have a different feel each time I play with those different characteristic cards. I also really love the AI. Man, the AI is hard in this game. It's only a set of six cards for each unique enemy. But those six cards always seem to know exactly what they should do to either heal themselves, shield themselves, or come at you and attack you so that you can't do what you are planning on. <laughs> the enemies will activate first before you go, except for in some certain circumstances. But so that means usually when you're planning on what you're going to do, you don't know what the AI is going to do. And so you plan for long range attack and all of a sudden, oh, they come up and melee and get into your face and no longer can you use your ranged attack on them. Yeah, it's so cool how it works and it makes for a very challenging and tight game. I also just love the adventure locations. All of them are so different. They provide you with different things that you can do. You can try and push your luck to gain some more success tokens or whatever they're called. I can't remember their name. But yeah, they give you different things that you can gain. You can gain your health. You can gain loot. You can also rest and gain some exposure, which might actually hurt you in the combat. But then you get benefits uh, right now to getting loot. Yeah, I just I love how the adventure locations work and how you have to push through them. Yet you can also explore them. Now this game is not going to be for you if you're not into the theme. The theme can be a little off-putting because of the humorous aspect of it. You gotta just either get over it or just laugh about it and enjoy it. I personally enjoy how combat works, but people who don't like abstract combat might not like it. Because there is no board, they're just going to tell you, oh they engage or disengage, and so it's, it's going to be a little bit messy. The difficulty of the game is very high, and that can be a turnoff. If you play this two or three times and you haven't won, you might give up. Now, I've played this six times, I think, and I've lost every time. So, <laughs> but I still like it. I keep coming back for more. Apparently, I like to be punished. <laughs> Gloom of Killforth is a 1-4 to four player cooperative or competitive game where players work against the clock to complete their own personal saga and take on the Ancient Ones before the entire world falls to gloom. For a solo game, you can choose 1-4 to four characters to play, but the game does not suffer at all from playing only one character. You'll move between locations meeting strangers, finding perils, and collecting trophies and money. As you continue to build your powers up to defeat the Ancient One, evil does not just sit and wait. The Ancient Ones will place plot cards over the board that will assist the Ancient One at the final end battle if you choose not to do anything with them. The game has this really awesome open feel about it as you can use your actions for whatever you'd like, but 
the countdown waits for no one. I really appreciate that in this game I can play with one character and it's an adventure game. That doesn't happen very often. Usually you have to play with two or three to get that full adventure feel. No, you can just play with one here and you're not losing anything. Although there isn't an overarching story in the game, since your character has a personal quest, it kind of leads you towards making certain decisions that provides you with a coherent story. The art in this game is the best that I have seen. You could be living under a rock and still enjoy how this game looks on your table. I also will say that the mechanics of the game are very simple, so you're not going to have a hard time trying to remember, oh, what am I trying to do? What are the actions that I can take? No, simple actions, yet you can get immersed into the story because of that. And yet it's still a challenge. It's hard to win because those enemies are going to be hard to defeat. And that ancient one looming over you, oh, <laughs> and those plot cards coming out. So you're always going to have a lot of things that you can do, but it's not a difficult game to understand. The game gives you a true adventure feel. And what I mean by that is I don't feel like I'm forced to do anything. I can do what I want, when I want, where I want to. <laughs> I love that. I love that I don't feel forced to have to puzzle out everything. I can just explore. Now I will say this game is not for you if you don't enjoy skill checks because you're going to be doing skill checks and they do use the older system of fives and sixes are successes and you have to be okay with that. Also the gothic theme can be a bit of a turnoff and honestly it was for me at first until I played the game. I didn't even care after that. I, I, the cards looked great and I enjoyed playing it enough that I kept it. Runebound, designed by Lucas Litzinger, published by Fantasy Flight Games, is a 1-4 to four player game set in the world of Terranoth. Players work together with the Unbreakable Bonds expansion to either defeat the boss or find the cure to the disease that is plaguing the land. Solo is identical in play to the multiplayer. In the game you will move around a map completing exploration quests, combat quests, and social quests to earn you trophies and money. With your money and trophies you'll obtain new skills and find new items. Each scenario provides players with a challenge that they must overcome. If the players can complete the necessary objectives before the end of Act 2, the players win. This game is another true adventure game. There's no requirements for you of where you need to go to be able to complete certain things. No, you get to decide where to go, where you want to quest. Do you want to go and do combat? You can go and fight enemies. But you, if you want to go and do a social quest or go and do an adventure quest, you can certainly do that. And that's what's so fun about the game. You get to decide how to create your adventure. I also really like how your character develops in this game. You'll find new skills and use trophies you've won through encounters to obtain new abilities. You also can purchase items which can provide you with additional combat tokens. Because at the end of the day, generally you're going to have to fight some enemies and those combat tokens can really help. If you're thinking about getting Runebound for solo play, definitely pick up the expansion. It provides you with all the right tools you need to enjoy the game. The battle sheets for the AI, two new scenarios specifically designed for co-op or solo, and the ability to play all other scenarios solo or co-op. Because of the expansion, this game has climbed up and up on my solo list, and that's why it's number three for me. Now, this game is not for you if you're looking for deterministic resolution. Almost everything is determined by dice, even movement on the board. Also, combat is with these tokens instead of with dice, so you're going to be casting tokens, which some people really don't like, but I personally love. I think it's, a, it's cool, it's unique, and it's different. Of all the games on this list, I think this one is the second longest for me. <laughs> the longest being Seventh Continent, but then Runebound. Nemo's War, designed by Chris Taylor, published by Victory Point Games, is a 1-4 to four player game where players are part of the crew of the infamous ship, the Nautilus. As this game was designed as a solo, the solo play is amazing. In the game, you'll be moving through the seas, sinking ships, inciting rebellions, and finding treasure. The game comes with four different motives that determine the amount of victory points you will receive for specific actions. As long as your ship is not destroyed or your notoriety gets too high, you can score points during the game. And at the end of the game, you can tally up your points and compare results from game to game. They also provide you with a scale that tells you, depending upon the amount of points you got, what level of success you had in the game. This is another game that I feel like is a true adventure game. There's nothing that I'm required to do. I can just explore the seas and find my way. Do I want to be combat heavy? Do I want to be exploration heavy? How do I want to gain my victory points? 
Part of that is determining your motive, and that's one of the best parts about the game. You can play the game in four different ways, and each way certain things will give you different victory points. For an example, my playthrough on this channel is the specific one about war, and so I got more victory points for sinking ships, so I did a lot more of that than maybe in the game where my focus is science and I'm trying to look more for exploration. You'll be rolling a ton of dice in this game, but one of the things you can do is mitigate all those dice rolls with modifications. You can utilize your crew, you can utilize Nemo himself, you can utilize your ship to add additional modifiers to your dice rolls. I also love how this game was designed for solo, so you're only playing one ship. You only have you to worry about. You don't have an extraneous AI you have to worry about. You don't have to run multiple characters. Nope, it's a single ship. And I have to say, I love the adventure cards. Although they do not provide you with a specific overarching story, the adventure cards allow you to swallow up the theme and get invested in the game personally, and I love that. Now this game is not for you if you're not a fan of dice rolling because there's a ton of dice rolling. And if you do want an overall coherent story or a campaign, you're not gonna get that here. Mage Knight, designed by Vlada Shvatil, published by WizKids, is a one to four player adventure board game where players can either work together, competitively, or player versus player, trying to complete specific objectives and obtain the most points at the end of the game. In a solo game, you have the Solo Conquest, where you are trying to take down two cities within three days and three nights. If you have the Lost Legion expansion, you can also add Volcare, who you can try and defeat, either through Volcare's Return or Volcare's Quest. You'll win this game by exploring, fighting, and recruiting units. You will use your deck of action cards or your deed cards to complete all of your actions. If you can complete the scenario within the allotted amount of time, you have won the game. I'm currently doing a playthrough of this one on my channel, so make sure to check that out if you're interested because this game is wonderful. Or better yet, go find Ricky Royal's playthrough. He does a great job. There are so many reasons why I love Mage Knight. The first and foremost is hand management. You're going to have a hand of five, six, or seven cards, and what you, can, what you can do is the actions that are on the cards themselves. But you can always turn one sideways and use it as one of any of the basic actions. So that provides you with tons of different options, and it provides you with tons of things that you can do. You'll never feel like you can't do anything on a turn. I love that the game comes with multi-use cards, and those multi-uses are so different. You'll have a top action and a bottom action. If you want to use that bottom action, you have to use a mana to power it. But a lot of times, those, those bottom actions are so much stronger than the top. <laughs> and they might even be different. Like for, for an example, one card might have a move on the top and an attack on the bottom. So it provides you with so much flexibility, which in an adventure game, I love. Although the game is more combat heavy than I would say the majority of the games on this list, it's still about the exploration. As you're progressing through, you're gonna be exploring through tiles, trying to find certain locations to either conquer or to utilize and recruit units. And I love the exploration and it just looks so beautiful on the table. The game is probably the most puzzly game in this list of 10 games. And for me, I love puzzle games. So that's why an, an adventure puzzle game is exactly what I want. And I feel like in this game, I have a direction. I know what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to defeat these cities or defeat Volcare. And so then I can figure out the best way to do that. No one's telling me how to do it. I can do it the way that I think is the best. Of all the games that I have on this list, this one is the most engaging. And I think that's because each aspect of the game is a little bit of a puzzle. So if I need to move, I need to generate enough move points. I don't just get a certain amount of move points. If I want to attack, I need a certain amount of attack points. If I want to recruit, I need a certain amount of influence points. So everything is about maximizing the cards in your hand, this maximum efficiency. Now, and this is kind of going into a, a negative. So if you're not looking for a game that's all about maximum maximum efficiency, this might not be the game for you. It might not be the, that adventure or exploration game that I love, but that's because that's what I want. I want to explore, but I also want to have to focus on every minute detail of my exploration. Am I going to have enough move points? Am I going to have enough influence to buy that unit? Am I going to be able to do what I want to do in the certain amount of time that I have? Yeah, I, I love that, but for certain people, that can be a turnoff. 
I have now played this game at least six or seven times, and I would say the replayability couldn't be higher. I'm not even close to scratching the surface of this game, and I could play this over and over again each time with a different experience and using the same scenario. I haven't even tried other scenarios. I haven't tried player versus player. I haven't tried competitive. I have tried cooperative, and I love cooperative, other than the simple fact that you can't affect other people on their turn. I wish there was a way that you could share mana or maybe play a card to help them. But other than that, I have loved this game. I would also say the replayability in this game is one of the highest on this list. That is because there are so many things that change each time you play. How the tiles come up, which which cities or um, what Volker has in his army is always different. And so it doesn't even matter that I start with this, essentially the same 16 cards each game. My experience is totally different. One time I might be focusing on keeps. Another time I might be focusing on wizard towers. Another time none of those are showing up, so I'm doing dungeons and temples. And, you know, it, it all depends upon what shows up on those tiles. And that's why I put this under exploration because it's all about what you explore and then making the best of what you're finding. Now I will say this game is not for you if you're not into trying to puzzling out the best actions for you. Okay, because that's what you're going to be doing every round. Do I want to play these cards to maximize my influence or do I keep some more in my hand so I can use them for movement or attack later? Also, the game is not strong in theme, and if you are looking for a similar game like this with a little more theme, check out Star Trek Frontiers. The game isn't perfect and I wouldn't even say it's better than Mage Knight it's just different and I will have a podcast on this specifically that'll be coming out this weekend so check that out if you want to see the differences between Star Trek and Mage Knight and finally if you're looking for a game with dice rolling and randomness in that way you're not going to get that here the only dice you're using are mana dice and you can mitigate a lot of the dice rolling for that so I would just say if you're looking for a dice chucker this isn't going to be your exploration game of choice and there you have it. That is my top 10. Hope you guys enjoyed it. If you liked anything that you saw there for any of those games, I think all but three of them I have playthroughs on this channel. So feel free to check them out. And also, if you guys have any ideas of other good top 10s you'd like to see, specifically in the solo or the co-op, just let me know. I will put them on the list, and I'm planning on doing these about once a month, maybe once every month and a half. Because I will say I still like to focus on playthroughs, but I really do enjoy doing these top 10 lists. Thank you all so much, and I'll see you at the next stop.